Okay, good morning. Today we're going to have our teach back on the chapters that you were expected to read on. Okay, and it has to do with a lot of topics that has to be covered. Uh, alteration in the immune function, right? The malignant WBC disorders, questions of hemostasis, uh, oxygen transport, and of course, blood flow, right? So let's start first with uh, the topic which is very important in nursing, which is blood flow. Obviously, in the, this chapter, the first thing that they did was to review the anatomy of the blood vessels and the heart. The role played by the heart as a muscular pump, right? We know for a fact that, uh, before I proceed, are we, are we good? Okay, I just want to be sure, did I put it on rec record or else? Okay, yes. Because <laughs> we'll be talking for, for hours and then all of a sudden it's not being recorded. Anyway, so apparently we talked about blood vessels and what's inside the blood vessel? Blood, of course, right? So, when we talk about blood vessels, we know for a fact that in the blood vessel wall, whether it is an artery or a vein, they have the same three layers in the wall, right? The first layer that you see there would be what? Chunika what? Intima. The word chunika means layer. This is the one that contains your endothelium, which is very thin, smooth when you're young. This is the one that lines, what do you call this opening here? It's called the lumen. Right? What is the second layer? The one in the middle. Chunika one. Media. And the first letter of media is M. It contains what? Muscle. What kind of muscle? Smooth. So this is contains smooth muscle. And you know what muscles can do. Muscles can either contract or relax. So when the smooth muscles contract, you end up with vaso what? Constriction. And when you vasoconstrict, what happens to the lumen? Gets smaller. And what happens to the blood flow? Decrease blood flow, but what will be the effect on blood pressure? Increase blood pressure. Very simple. Now, what is the opposite of contract? Muscles can also what? Relax. And therefore, as such, when these smooth muscles here relax, you open up the passageway of blood, it's called vaso what? Very good. And what, this is, what will be the effect on blood flow? Increase blood flow. Why? Because you open up, it's become bigger. Therefore, more blood can go through, which makes sense, right? Now, what will be the effect if you vasodilate on the blood pressure? Down. It will go down, right? Now, have you ever experienced this when you are watering the garden, the plants in the garden, and then when you try to open the garden hose, the water pressure is low, right? And what do we do with the tip? We what? We put our fingers here, and you are actually constricting it, what happens to the pressure of the water? Hi. It goes up. Have you ever experienced that, you know? I do that, like uh, it's like a uh, power pressure, like you would want to clean the car and then, shh, you know. The point therefore is that this is something that is very important in the field of nursing and medicine. So if, I, if my patient has high blood pressure, which is defined as a blood pressure that is above 140 over 90, what kind of drug would Dr. Gamo prescribe this patient? A vasodilator or a vasoconstrictor? Huh? Of course, because a vasodilator drug will what will it do to the blood pressure? Lower the blood pressure. It's just common sense. Isn't that what we call critical thinking? The application of knowledge in the classroom makes you understand why did Dr. Gamo prescribe a vasodilator? Because the goal is to lower what? The blood pressure, because what is the problem? The blood pressure is high or elevated, it's called hypertension. 
question now is, what happens if you are a student from a different school and you answered vasoconstrictor? What will be the effect of that drug on the blood pressure? It will even go up. That's stupid. Oh, that's uh, the most illogical thing to do. And that is how you fail the nursing board exam. If given a choice between two drugs, one will vasodilate, one will vasoconstrict, and you have the nursing student who's taking the board, board exam, and you answer, I will give this drug, are you crazy? The problem is high blood pressure, and you give a drug that will increase further the blood pressure, what would be the consequence there? Die. Patient can die. Rest in six permanent resident at six feet under the ground and permanent resident at Forest Lawn. How could a patient die with hypertension? Very simple. In a hypertensive emergency, your blood pressure can shoot up as high as 220 over 100 plus. And when your blood pressure is high, what are the chances of your cerebral arteries rupturing and bursting? Very high. You end up with a hemorrhagic stroke. And if there's too much blood or bleeding inside the brain, the skull is hard, the brain is soft. You have increased intracranial pressure, the brain will slide down into the foramen magnum, it's called brain herniation, bang! And the last part of the brain is called the medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata will be crushed by the foramen magnum, part of the occipital bone. If this is the occipital foramen magnum, this is the medulla oblongata, bang! What happens if you s compress the medulla oblongata when the brain herniates or slides down because of increased pressure because of bleeding inside the brain? What happens if you s compress the medulla oblongata? You will stop what? You will stop what? You will stop what? You will stop what? <laughs> Repetition <laughs> is the mother of all retention. You will stop what? Breathing. Because you compress what? Medulla oblongata, which is part of your brain, stem, brain, stem, brain, stem. Mm -hmm. And when the patient stops breathing, can he die? Yeah. Of course! You need to understand why it's so important to know your anatomy, your physiology. Knowing the fact that the medulla oblongata is part of the brain stem and therefore when the brain herniates, the medulla is above the foramen magnum, but when the brain herniates, bang! The medulla gets compressed, you stop breathing, you die. That's the reason why we have to what? Release and drain the blood by performing an emergency what? Craniotomy. You understand what I'm trying to say. But it all started by the fact that you have a person with high blood pressure, and if you answer, you give this drug, you're making it worse. Now, what's the third layer class? Tunica what? Adventitia. And this is made up of what? Elastic connective tissue fibers, collagen fibers. And apparently, Adventitia, Adventitia A, it has a capacity to stretch, mm -hmm. which is amazing. It's helping control the high elevation pressure that can happen. Okay? Now, between arteries and veins, they have the same layers, right? And apparently, we are aware of these, right? Now let us go into the, the law of, what is this formula? R is equal to 8 and L versus pi R to the fourth. Can anybody tell me what is the name of this formula? What is it? Pocell. How do you spell Pocell? P P O I I and then what? Right? The Pocell's law is this, where R is what? Resistance, and N is what? Viscosity, and L is what? Length of the blood vessel, and then what is R? Small R. Big R, resistance, small R is what? Okay, radius of the artery. So this N to the other N is what? Diameter. What is radius? Half of that diameter one half of diameter. It means from the middle part of the circle to the side here. That is radius. So, can anybody tell me the relationship between these factors here? Between R and 
resist outrageous. What's the relationship? Direct or inverse? Inverse. Inverse. Where did you learn this class? Basic math. Grade school. Grade school. If you do not know this, you are in deep stool. Okay? Now, what is the definition of resistance? What, how would you define resistance, class? In Opposing forces. Okay. Forces that will oppose what? Blood flow. In other words, it will oppose the blood flow. It will limit the amount of blood flowing. I'll give you an example. Okay. If you have fat deposits here, if this is the heart, this is the left ventricle, this is the aorta, this is the aorta, the moment you start to have a fat deposit there, will that offer resistance? Yeah, of course. Because the blood flows what? When the heart pumps, chik chik, chik chik, chik chik, the blood will flow this way. But because there's like a roadblock, partial occlusion of the lumen will prevent the flow. It, is, is it going to oppose, is it a force that will oppose the flow of blood? It is. Or, if you have an artery that vasodiconstricts, what happens to the passageway or the, the radius? It gets smaller, there's more resistance. So the bottom line is, if by looking at this, if you decrease the radius, what will be the effect on resistance? Increased resistance. That's what they mean by inverse. On the other hand, when you increase the radius, what happens to the resistance? Decrease resistance. Do you understand? What about the relationship between viscosity and resistance? Direct or direct? Direct. In other words, when you increase viscosity, you increase resistance. If you lower viscosity, then you lower resistance to flow. What about length of the blood vessel? The longer the blood vessel, the more resistance you have. Because what is the relation between all these factors? Directly relation. Direct relation. Okay? Direct proportion, direct relation. Now, if you decrease the length, which can never happen because you can never shorten your blood vessels, right? It can never happen theoretically, but if you look at this formula, Lower this, you lower resistance. Up, up. Does that make sense? Of all the parameters involved here, which one do you think can easily be modified? Race. Just like what I told you. When I told you we can vasodilate, it can help solve the problem of blood flow problem, right? I'll give you an example. What is the name of the artery that provides arterial oxygenated blood to the myocardium? It's called what? Coronary. 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 How many do you have? Two, just like your hands. I have two hands, the left and the right. What do you call those coronaries? Right and left coronary artery, right? Right and left with all their branches. Now, what happens? Now, I forgot to mention the other law. What is this law? Q is equal to P over R. Q is blood flow. P is pressure, what, gradient or difference? So that means P greater to what? Lower pressure. What do I mean by that? The blood will always flow. Which one has the greatest pressure of all the chambers in the heart? Right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, or left ventricle? It always, the left ventricle, the wall is so thick, mm -hmm. it generates the highest pressure because you expect the blood to flow from high pressure to low. From high pressure to low. High pressure to low. That's the reason why it flows this way. It has to be that way. Because your goal is to what? Like this is the diaphragm here. Mm -hmm. The aorta, the thoracic aorta becomes abdominal. What is the blood supply to the kidney? Renal artery. Renal artery. What about the blood supply to the liver? Hepatic. Hepatic artery. What about the spleen? Splenic artery. In order to provide oxygenated blood to these organs from high pressure to low, high pressure to low, high pressure to low, high pressure to low. And that's how you provide blood supply. 
or blood flow to these organs. Does that make sense? That's called pressure gradient. And what is R here? Resistance. And this is blood flow, the Q. This is called what flow? Very good. What page is this in the new textbook? What page? 311. Huh? 318 and 319, I think, right? Okay. So if you are not in the same page, you go to the page, you can see that it's there. Okay? So you have gone beyond, I can tell. There you go, I can see. You understand? Okay? So that is the formula there. Okay? There you are, and then the other one is there. Okay? So the idea here, therefore, is that when you decrease the radius, what happens to resistance? Resistance goes up. And when resistance goes up, what is the relationship between blood flow and resistance? Inverse or inverse? Again, inverse. In other words, when you decrease the radius, you increase the resistance. When you increase the resistance, what happens to the blood flow? Decrease. It goes down. Again, when there is the presence of fat deposits here, or fat deposits on the wall of the aorta or the artery, what happens to the radius? It goes down. And when this goes down, what happens to the resistance? It goes up. And if you bring this up, what happens to the blood flow? It goes down. That's the reason why the blood flow to these organs could be diminished. The prime example would be the heart. If you have fat deposits here on the coronary arteries, what happens to the radius? The same thing. The radius goes down, resistance goes up, and when resistance goes up, what happens to the blood flow? It diminishes the blood flow to the myocardium. And what is the term we used when there is decreased blood flow to a particular organ or tissue? It's called what? It begins with letter I. Perfect. It's called what? Myocardial ischemia. So what organ is involved? The heart? What part of the heart? The myocardium. The heart is a muscular pump. So what is ischemia? Decrease what? What is causing the decreased blood flow? The presence of fat deposits on the wall of the coronary arteries. Now what is the term we use to describe the deposition of fat on the wall of the tunica intima of an artery? Atherosclerosis. And the presence of that fat will that cause hardening of the artery. So sclerosis means hardening. Yes, yes it will. Okay? Sclerosis, hardening, because of the deposition of fat. Now what do you call that fat deposit there? There is a name for that. Plaque. Plaque of recognition that you're gonna die. <laughs> like me, look at me. I have so much fat in my abdominal belly. Now where do you think this excess fat will go? There. Will I die? Yes. Maybe a couple of years from now, I can tell. I want to die because I want to meet my parents up there. If, if they're in heaven, I'll be there. If I'm good, I'll be there. No, I'm just joking, of course. The bottom line is that what will you experience when you have ischemia? When the blood flow to the myocardium is decreased, you will experience what? What will be my chief complaint in the emergency room? Chest pain. I have chest pain. Chest pain due to cardiac origin always starts below the heart, sternum, mm -hmm. substernum, heavy in character. If there's an elephant standing on your chest, it radiates to the shoulder, radiates to the upper arm, forearm, and the left hand, and to the jaw. That's called referred pain. That is seen in patients with chest pain due to, due to cardiac origin, not lung origin. Okay? <laughs> So, <coughs> ischemia, is that reversible or irreversible? Irreversible, irreversible or reversible? Irreversible. irreversible. Who says irreversible? Okay, I see some hands. Who says it's reversible? No one. Who says reversible? No one. Unfortunately, everybody in this room is wrong. They're wrong. What is the difference between myocardial ischemia and myocardial infarction? Is there a difference? What's the difference? I'm trying to justify why your answers are wrong. No, it's okay. 
That's how you learn. All of you raise your hand that it is irreversible. Which one is irreversible? Am I or ischemia? Am I? This is the one that is irreversible. Irreversible. And this is reversible. I'll tell you why. In here, the presence of the fat deposit, did it obstruct the flow of blood? No. It obstructs, but not fully. That's why. Yeah. Is it yes or no? The presence of fat deposit in the coronary artery, did it obstruct the flow of blood? Yes or no? Yes. 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 What kind of obstruction? Partial or partial? Partial. partial. I like your accent. Is that Russian? Or yeah, Russian. You are Russian. I have Russian blood too. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> it's partial obstruction. Partial. Because if this were a freeway, there's an accident, you can still go through. But you have to slow down. What happens in here? Simple. As time goes by, I keep on going to the emergency room. I have chest pain. I have angina pectoris here, chest pain. I don't die. Why? Because it's just ischemia. That's the reason why it's called IHD or CAD. Ischemic heart disease, coronary artery disease, or atherosclerotic heart disease. Do they mean the same thing? Yes, they do. Will I die? No, I don't. Will I have chest pain? Yes, I will. Because there's not enough blood flow to the myocardium. I don't die. Thank God. Not yet. Now, can this progress to this eventually? Yo. Definitely. How? One, two, three years later, I do not exercise. I, I always go to Panda Express. <laughs> Instead of using the stairs, what do I do? Use the elevator. Have you ever seen me climb the stairs once every week? <laughs> I used to be a basketball player. I was playing basketball every day in high school and medical school. Now, I don't play basketball. So uh, is that a risk factor for the development of heart disease? Yeah. So, what happens now to this fat deposit to get bigger and bigger? Eventually and then the blood flow becomes what? Faster or slower? Slower. And slower. And when the blood flow becomes slower and slower, will that blood clot? Yeah. Of course. So you have two problems. One is the presence of a fat deposit called plaque attached to the wall. And then as time goes by, there is the formation of a blood clot in the middle. And what will the blood clot and fat deposit do? Complete obstruction. And when there is complete obstruction of the coronary artery, will there be blood flow here? No. Zero. Zero blood flow. No blood flow, without blood, without oxygen, the muscle tissue here, the myocardium, will die. die. It's called necrosis or infarction, tissue death. And what kind of necrosis is this? Is this castration, liquefactive, fat necrosis, or coagul coagulative? Because what is to coagulate? To clot. Does that make sense to you people? Where did we learn the topic on coagulative necrosis? Was it the first week or second week of class? First, second week, right? The first part, the first chapter, chapter four. Chapters one, two, four, seven, right? So what am I trying to say here? Whatever lessons you have learned in the past, is it cumulative learning? Does it make sense to you? So whatever you learn, you have to apply the next chapter, the next chapter. So this area will die. Is this reversible? No, it's irreversible. Is this reversible? Yes. Okay. How can you solve the problem of chest pain here? Are you familiar with the drug called nitroglycerin? 
Have you heard of this drug? Mm. Okay, what is this drug going to do? You put it under the tongue. You put it as the form of a medication skin patch. What do you have here? Blood vessels. What do you have under the tongue? Blood vessels. Then these blood vessels eventually end up here. Because they travel into the five, five north and five south freeway called blood vessels. The aorta and the vena cava. Okay? Then there are veins. So remember the veins go here? So they travel all throughout in the blood circulate. So are there veins and capillaries here? Yes. Are there veins and capillaries in the skin? So there is an access. It's like a ramp to the freeway, you know? I want to get out of Victoria, I go to Victoria, I go to 170 what? South. I want to go home to Anaheim, the same thing. So by giving those drugs under the tongue or under the, on the chest, there are blood vessels there called capillaries. They enter the blood circulation freeway. The problem now is this, this drug, what does it do? Does it cause vasodilation or vasoconstriction? It's what? Vaso what? Okay. So when this drug reaches the coronary arteries, what do you think it will do to the smooth muscles? Relax, vasodilate. What happens to the blood flow? Increase. Simple. When you vasodilate, you increase the radius, you decrease the resistance, you decrease the resistance, where's the ohm flow? Decrease the resistance, goes down, what happens to the blood flow? It goes up. What am I trying to say? These two formulas, therefore, will explain in scientific form everything we do in medicine. What we're trying to show, therefore, is that as a student who learns, you have to be able to justify and explain why it is important to know the basic principles of anatomy and physiology in relation to math, physics, science. Because we are men and women of science. We are men and women with a smart brain that you have to use and maximize the use. Especially that you come from the best university in the world, the best in the West, called West Coast, right? So a West Coast student is smart. A West Coast student is a critical thinker. A West Coast student will always pass the varsity board exam with 100% passing rate, especially in your batch. You understand? Now, when this drug vasodilates, will it help relieve the chest pain? Yes. That's the reason why this drug is known as anti-anginal drug. Anti means against angina. But the problem is that when you increase the blood flow, what will be the effect on blood pressure? Yeah. It's called hypotension. The systolic pressure can go below, below 90. So let's say the baseline. You are the patient in the intensive care unit. You get the blood pressure. The blood pressure was 120 over 80. You gave this drug. Can that go down to 90, systolic? It can, but why I have to give the person with so, 20? So the question now is this. Whenever you give this drug for chest pain, do we ask the nurses to monitor the blood pressure? Yeah. yeah. So let's say at 6 in the morning, patient complains of chest pain, ordered in the chart, nitroglycerin sublingual PRN. What does PRN mean? As needed. As needed. So you wrote down in the chart, at 6 p.m. the blood pressure was 120, you give what? Nitroglycerin because it was ordered by Dr. Gamo. After 10 minutes, you get the blood pressure, it went down to 90. Was this an effect of the drug? Maybe. So you call Dr. Gamo, Dr. Gamo, I gave that to glycerin at 6, at 6.15 or 6.10, the blood pressure dropped from 120 to 90. What are the possible things I would do? One is I would tell you, okay, this time, instead of 5 milligrams, lower it to 2.5 and observe. If there's no drop, then continue with 2.5 as PRN medication. Do you, does that make sense to you? Now, let's say even though I lower the drug, it's still persistently low, then I may have to change something else, give another drug. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that is how we think. We are men of science. You are supposed to be men and women of science too. And you have to understand why. Why we have to lower because the effect is hypotension. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Okay? Is that clear? So, now, do you understand what we do in this, in this world? Now, are we going to give drugs that will lower the cholesterol levels? Like yeah. Lipitor. Mm -hmm. what, is, what is Lipitor? These are the statin drugs, lip, simvastatin, you know. These drugs are designed to lower the fat deposit levels because they will eventually end up depositing on the wall of the coronary arteries, right? Okay. 
So I need to do that. Like me, I don't know, I don't know my cholesterol levels because I never had it examined. No, I'm just kidding. I had it examined recently because after four years, my wife told me, okay, you need to see the doctor. The last time you saw the doctor at Cedar Sinai was four years ago. I don't want you to die. Okay, okay. Yes, honey. I went there two weeks ago. The good news is everything is normal. So I will not die yet. So because I still want to go all over the place, you know, all over the world. So I said, okay, I need to exercise. I keep on saying that, but it's all in the mind. <laughs> I have a basketball court at the back of my house. When was the last time I played in that court? Maybe five years ago. <laughs> okay, going back to this, therefore. So as you can see here, the, the idea, therefore, is that everything can be explained. If you have memorized this and you can do what I do here, then that's the best way to learn. How many of you have a whiteboard at home? You have no, you have no whiteboard, a small one like this? Huh? No, who has a whiteboard at home? I have one there, one there. Okay. Did I not tell you, some of you were my first two more tools in anatomy, I told you to buy a whiteboard. If you have none, I can sell it to you cheap. I, I get things from Swapmeet, I buy it for $5, I sell it to you for $10. <laughs> But you don't have to travel all the way to Anaheim, the Cypress College there. The I, I go there every Saturday and Sunday. If you're interested, I get it for five, I sell it to you for ten. You save on gas. I'm just joking. You go to Walmart. I think the cheapest whiteboard there as big as this. I think it's around $25 or Costco. It's an investment in learning. The best way to learn is do what I do here. I'm not trying to say me become like me, no. I'm just more handsome than anybody else here, so. You can never be like me. It's all dark and never mind. <laughs> In other words, I'm not handsome. So, because, can you imagine if you keep on doing this, my goodness, write this down 10 times a day, <coughs> and then erase, and then write this down again, and erase, write it down, the <coughs> same thing. <coughs> Would you ever forget? <coughs> no. So when you go to core nursing, You'll probably end up better than the faculty. I'm not saying they're not smart, but they're also smart, right? So, when I was in med school, and well, especially pre-med, med school, I was just chill. Pre-med school, because we had to competitive. I had, my my bo motto was, I have to be smarter than my teacher. If she reads one book, I read ten books. That's how I, I was able to go into med school. Mm -hmm. so, so I have to know more than my teacher, but I have to be humble, you know. Because when the teacher sees that you're not humble, you're arrogant, you find a way to lower your score, you know, so. Especially if it's those essay type. I hate essays, so. Now, when you come to this, therefore, you can see here the importance of this thing, right? Now, what brings blood to the right atrium here? Superior vena cava and then what? Inferior vena cava, right? All the veins in the, leg, uh, in the head and the neck, and the upper limbs come from the superior vena cava, like here, see? What about the veins in the leg and the veins here and here and here? They go to the inferior vena cava, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. In blood flow, what is the term used to describe when there is the presence of a clot in the leg veins and there is inflammation of the leg veins? What is that term called? Thrombophlebitis. And what exactly is a thrombus? Is it a stationary clot or a traveling clot? It simply means that it is what? This is the vein. The clot is attached to the wall mm -hmm. and the vein is inflamed. Flebo means vein, flebitis, phlebotomy. Remember the phlebotomy? Mm -hmm. it creates a hole, the blood comes out. They drain the blood from you. They're like vampires with the phlebotomist. <laughs> so, when the vein is inflamed, it's called phlebitis. And there's a thrombus, a stationary clot. It's called what? Thrombophlebitis, okay? Now, is that life-threatening? Yes, I'll tell you why. This condition called thrombophlebitis often is seen when patients are not moving or not exercising. It's very commonly seen in the hospital or the nursing homes where people are 60, 70 years old, they lie down in bed, they're so depressed, you're not visiting them because you're so busy with work and mom, I'll visit you next week and then the next week becomes two weeks and then three weeks and your mom is so depressed, guess what? She's 70 years old, you lie down in bed, she wants just to die. And you will lie down and lie down and lie down, she doesn't want to cooperate with exercise. 
when you have a sedentary lifestyle, that clot can form and the clot becomes a stationary clot and the vein becomes inflamed. Now that could have been prevented if you ask the patient to walk, 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 exercise, right? How do you prevent this? Exercise walking. Now what happens if this is already present? Would you exercise the leg? No, why? The clot that's attached to the wall could be dislodged and it becomes what? A traveling clot. Now it, it travels here, will it stop in the vena cava? No, why? This is a big blood vessel. Will it stop in the right atrium? No, it's a big chamber. Will it stop in the right ventricle? No, it's a big chamber. Will it stop in the pulmonary trunk or artery? No, these are big blood vessels. Will it stop in the lung? Yeah. Yes. yes, because in the lung you have pulmonary what? Capillaries. And what do you find in pulmonary capillaries? Small blood vessels. It's a capillary. Only one red, red blood cell can go through. And what happens if only one blood vessel, one or one red blood cell can go through? A clot is even bigger, mm -hmm. so the clot stops where? In the lung. It's called pulmonary what? Embolism. So the clot got detached from the wall, it traveled to the lungs, you have pulmonary embolism because the clot is formed on the right side of the heart or here. Any clot here, any clot there will end up with a pulmonary embolism. Can you die of pulmonary embolism? Yeah. So you are doing, because you're not from West Coast, you come from a, a different place, you exercise the leg and after five minutes the patient complains of sudden onset of what? Shortness of breath or son of a uh, shortness of breath, SOB. <gasps> and then you tell the nurse, a patient, sorry ma'am, I just killed you because I exercised your leg. See you in heaven. Okay? Now I'm just joking, of course. Did you kill the patient? Of course. It's called NID. What is NID? Nurse induced death. I'm just joking, there's no such thing. <laughs> who killed the patient? Who called? Uh, who? What, what is that song? Who uh, made the, uh, the dogs get out or something? <laughs> who, who let the dogs out? <laughs> who killed the patient out? Yes, the nurse. <laughs> Same thing with D. What is DID? Doctor induced death. Can a doctor kill a patient? Sure. Yes, there are so many incompetent doctors in the world. I call them stupid doctors, you know. Yeah. They don't use their what? The organ between their ears. <laughs> it's crazy. And it's hard when you have a doctor like that, right? When I have I had a bad experience with many colleagues of mine, my, even my father was mis misdiagnosed, my brother, the same thing. And they all died because of the misdiagnosis of stupid doctors, right? So, the bottom line is this. So, the, the idea, therefore, is that when this goes here, you could have a pulmonary embolism, you could die. But how do you prevent it? Exercise, but once you have it, do not move the leg. We understand. Now, what do you, how do you treat that? You can either what give. What is heparin and warfarin? These are anti What are anticoagulant drugs do? They prevent further clot formation. Heparin and warfarin, or heparin is a drug, and then warfarin or coumadin. The warfarin is the same as coumadin. They're anticoagulants. They prevent further clot formation. What is a drug that will dissolve the clot? What's a drug that will dissolve the clot? It's called thrombolytic drugs. What's a thrombolytic drug? What does a drug do if it's thrombolytic? Dissolve, lysis, to break down. Do you understand? Okay? And surely they end with ACE. Streptokinase, urokinase, abokinase. Especially here when you have a clot here. It's the reason why the, the first three hours is the golden period of giving these drugs. If you have a chest pain, you want to give this drug as soon as possible. Because the moment you go beyond three hours, it becomes an MI. You understand? So you have to want to dissolve the clot there. Now, anticoagulant, can they dissolve the blood clot? No, they don't. So drugs like heparin or warfarin, also known as coumadin, they're what? Anti-what? Coagulants. What they can do is just prevent further clot formation, but they will never dissolve the blood clot. 
This is the one that we give to dissolve the class. Do you, do you understand class? Okay? Out in place, ace, ace, anything that ends with ace. Okay, now, what is DVT? Deep vein thrombosis affects what? The deep veins. Oftentimes, thrombophlebitis affects the superficial veins. So, how does a nurse know that the patient is suffering from thrombophlebitis? The chief complaint would be what? Leg pain. So when you have leg pain, the first thing you do is what? Confirm and examine your patient. The patient will say, ma'am, I have left leg pain. So what do you do? Examine the left leg. So you go like this. What's wrong with my, you don't like my legs? It's a little bit dry, but it's beautiful. And the patient says, I have leg pain. And you ask the patient, ma'am, sir, where is the leg pain? In front or the back? They, oh, it's here. Why? Because that's where the veins are. Oh, I'm okay, just kidding. Do you find any blood vessel in here? It's bone called tibia. Mm -hmm. So is it important to know your anatomy and physiology again? These veins are embedded in the muscle. What do you call this beautiful muscle here? Gastrocnemius. yes. And what is the small muscle underneath? Soul, yes. Achilles tendon. So the veins are there. It's called saphenous vein. There's so many veins. So how do you know? What are the cardinal signs of inflammation? Rubor, what is rubor? Redness. Oh, I can see a 10 millimeter redness, redness on the posterior aspect, middle portion of the calf muscles. Then you palpate, oh, it's warm. It's calor in Spanish, caliente. And what is dolor? Symptom, pain. And what is tumor? T-U-M-O-R, swelling increase in size. When, and in fact, if you are really smart, you get a tape measure. Mm -hmm. And what do you do with the tape measure? Measure, measure the circumference of the cuff. Mm -hmm. And then do a measurement of the what? No whole leg. Da -da 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 -da. The right cuff. Compare the difference. This is 10, let's say 10 cm here. And this is 15 cm there. Which one is bigger? 15. In the left leg. If you do that, then I can say that you are really from West Coast. You are very, very, very smart. You make use of a tape measure, not the ruler. <laughs> ruler, ruler. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So, so you put that in your nursing notes. On measurement of a circumference of the left leg, which is measured from uh, the head of the fibula to here, 10 cm here, it was discovered that the patient's circumference of the left leg was 15 centimeters. On the right leg, this is point of reference with the head of the fibula, 10 cm, and then I measured from there, it was 10 cm. Obviously, the left leg is much bigger than the right because the left leg has thrombophlebitis, it's swollen, it's redness, it's present, and you can even describe how much diameter of the redness, 10 millimeters redness. On palpation, there was tenderness. Tenderness is a term we use when there is pain on touch. So, I will order these drugs. You understand what I'm saying, okay? Now, deep vein thrombosis, I think some of you joined the virtual classroom yesterday. I think I see the same pe people, not the same patients, same students. There were eight or nine of them yesterday. What example did they give you? I don't know if I did it. Yes, Ms. Canal, what did they say? The airplane, when you... Yeah, when my bags are packed, I'm ready to go. So last year I went home to the Philippines where I was born, even though I'm not an American citizen, so it takes 15 hours to travel, right? On that 30,000 feet, up on top of the Pacific Ocean. And then when you sit on that chair for 15 hours without moving your leg, what are the chances of developing DVT high? And you end up with a blood clot, and that clot in the deep vein go to the lungs, the same, the same freeway, the 405 North, which happens to be the inferior vena cava. So what do you recommend when you're riding a plane? So I, what I normally do, I stand and then I walk around, meeting new young women, you know, hi. <laughs> I'm single, ready to meet, I'm just joking, of course. I just go around, I go, uh, it was so funny when, um, I would walk to the front of the plane and walk to the other end of the plane, and then just walk and then, you know, move my legs, my gastric knee is. <laughs> walk like this and walk that way, 
And then I would, you know, do this and do that, you know, and then I go to the restroom, even though I'm not about to make wee wee, just go to the restroom, pretend, you know, yeah. form a line, you know, and then, you know, because that is how you prevent DVT. If you don't do that, how do you know? <laughs> you go down the plane, you go to the carousel, get in your bag, and then suddenly develop chest. I can't breathe. I have chest pain. I have developed the VT. I'm going to die with pulmonary embolism. And that's what's going to happen. <laughs> so if you plan to go to Europe or faraway places where the plane ride, going to the East Coast five, six hours is probably OK. Let's say you probably would like to walk, you know. Walk around, walk around, OK? So that is DVT. Now, let's move on. Up here we said there is, what's an aneurysm? An aneurysm is nothing else but what? <coughs> if this is the artery, it's what? Ballooning of the wall, like this, right? And as the wall gets bigger because of the high blood pressure, it can what? Burst or rupture. Can you have an aneurysm in the cerebral arteries yes. of the brain? You end up with a hemorrhagic stroke. Mm -hmm. Can you have an aneurysm in your abdominal aorta? Yes. yes. Can it rupture? Of course, you will probably be dead within one minute or less. Because you know how big the aorta is, right? Okay? So how do we treat this? You can read on this. You can either what clipping of the aneurysm to clip means to put the metal thing here, or you can put a coil. Mm -hmm. And it will stop the, the possible rupture of bleeding. And how do you diagnose? It's very simple. We inject a dye. What's a dye? Radio opaque, white dye. The dye will flow here into the veins, inject into the vein, goes here, goes there, to the lung, blah, blah. And then you can, if there's an aneurysm here, the dye is white. Mm -hmm. You do an MRI scan or CT scan with angiogram. When you do an angiogram, you are actually what? Injecting what? A dye. Or at what we call contrast material. Is that going to help diagnose an aneurysm? Yes. Now how is it that some people are misdiagnosed because they did put a dye? You remember John Ritter? I don't know if you know him. Uh, Three's Company, famous in the 80s. I was, I was born in the 60s, so I know this guy. John Ritter had an aneurysm. But it was here in Aorta. He was, he was trying to do a comeback on television, and this probably happened two, three, four years ago. He had an aneurysm. He went to one of the hotels here in Burbank, I don't know, with St. Joseph or what. It was too late. He died of an aneurysm. It's a dissecting aneurysm. And the wife sued the hospital. I said, why did you not see this? Last year, my husband went to this hospital. They did a CT scan or MRI scan. How come they did not see it? Very simple. Because whoever saw him did not do what? Inject a dye. Because if you injected a dye, will you be able to see that bulge there or ballooning of the wall? Yes. Because why? Everything will be white, 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 white. It will also be white. But when you give a dye, you watch out for allergy to what? Shellfish. shellfish. What does shellfish have? Iodine. What does the dye have? Iodine. iodine. If you have an allergy to shellfish or iodine containing shellfish, then most likely you have an allergy to what? The dye or contrast material. So when you give that dye, it will lead to what? Bronchospasm and bronchoconstriction. You can have anaphylactic shock, but which one will kill you? Anaphylactic shock or the bronchospasm right away? Oh. Bronchospasm. You stop breathing. <laughs> what did you inject me with? <laughs> the dye. Did you not, you have to ask, this is not, I'm mm -hmm. not kidding. In the nursing board exam, one of the first things the nurse must do is ask, ma'am, sir, do you have allergy to shellfish? Or any form of allergy. Do you have any allergy to aspirin or penicillin or drugs? Because they can die because of what? Mm -hmm. Bronchoconstriction and bronchospasm. Okay? Is that clear? So we talked about resistance, pressure, thrombus, embolus, the difference between the two. Blood flow Q plus PR. Now coagulation factors, where do you make them? In the liver, clotting factors. In order for the blood to clot, you need what? Your prothrombin, fibrinogen, they're produced where? In the liver. That's why when you have liver, have you heard of liver cirrhosis? What exactly is that? Scarring for scar formation in the liver due to chronic alcohol and hepatitis infections, right? And then if you destroy or have liver failure, can you produce your clotting factors? You know, you don't. Will the blood be able to clot? No, you end up with bleeding. You have spider lesions, spider, we call them spider like, like spider webs. You'd have to write it down with spider telangiectasia and then hematoma. 
you could bleed because of liver damage. So how many of you drink alcohol here? Okay, go ahead, continue drinking so that uh, I can see you in the hospital, I can visit you, okay? And if you need a liver transplant, tell me because I have a classmate in medical school who's a liver transplant surgeon in the East Coast. Thomas Jefferson in Philadelphia, I can give you a $1,000 discount instead of spending $1 million, you'll only be spending $999,000. <laughs> so go ahead, go, go continue drinking. I'm just joking, of course. Now, in terms of platelet, we know platelets are designed to what? If you have a, a, a gunshot wound, a blood, a bleeding will occur why? because there's a hole in the wall, so the blood will come out. What do the Platelets do. Platelets are not cells. They're fragments of the big cell called megakaryocyte. This pl platelet will aggregate. What is platelet aggregation? They, they come together, they hold hands, and then, I'm just kidding, they, they will stick to each other, and then what? The hole is here in the blood vessel, which is bleeding. This will form a what? A, a plug. What's a plug? A temporary plug, and the, clot, the blood clot will form to stop the bleeding. In order for the blood to clot, you need two things, therefore. What is the first thing? Platelet, and the other one is what? Clotting factors, in order for the blood to clot, okay? Now, anemia, what is anemia? It's the decrease in the red blood cell count. What's the most common form of anemia? A higher deficiency anemia. Why? Because we know the red blood cell is made up as hemoglobin. Hemo means the hem, and the globin is the protein component. Mm -hmm. Maybe albumin and globulin, globin. So it has two alpha chains and two beta chains. Each of these chain has the, what? The hem component, right? Which is made up of the porphyrin ring. And what is inside that porphyrin ring or hem? Iron. Iron. So if you have two alpha and two beta, two plus two is four, how many oxygen molecules can it carry? Four. Four. Does that make sense? In order you need to have iron. So if you do not have iron in your diet, you develop iron deficiency anemia. What about the pregnant woman? Why do they develop iron deficiency anemia? Because they're competing with who? The baby. And what do we give these patients? Iron supplements in the form of ferrous sulfate. Ferrous, F-E-R-R-O-U-S, sulfate, S-U-L-F-A-T-E. The only problem with this drug is that it will make your pupo become what? Black. And you get a lot, oh my God, what's the color of your poo-poo? Yeah. Huh? Oh wait, no. Normal. Normal brown. Okay, this morning I went to the bath toilet bowl and I said, it's golden, yellow, brown. You know what's gold? Shining, golden, yellow, brown. Something greenish. Because of the effect of bile. The moment it turns black, it means there could be bleeding stomach ulcers. But in this case, it's because of the side effect of the drug you gave the patient. Yeah. Ferrous sulfate. How many of you have you, how many of you taken ferrous sulfate? Have you taken it? You were given by, when you got pregnant? No, no, no. I was for iron So you were given ferrous sulfate because you were not pregnant, right? It was more something of iron deficiency. Okay. Did your black, did your still turn black? You don't remember? Okay, I'll give you one more and then five and final. Okay, go tell us next week, okay? I'm just kidding. Who, who else has taken ferrous sulfate? Okay, tomorrow we'll buy and then we'll all experiment. <laughs> What's wrong with you? That's the only way to learn, right? Is Dr. Gamo telling us the truth? Seek you the truth and the truth shall set you free from ignorance. So today we'll all buy ferrous sulfate. In the, I don't know if it's over the counter, you know. <laughs> and we're gonna... And then after five hours, shit! <laughs> it's black. Okay? Also, is it really quick? It's changing the color of teeth, yes? I think so. I, I have never tasted it because I've never become pregnant, so... <laughs> Can you imagine Dr. Gal becoming pregnant? It turned out to be a hermaphrodite, you know? <laughs> I'm just joking, of course. Okay, now... What exactly is your multiple myeloma? I'm just, I forgot this. Uh, what about hemolytic disease of the newborn? Okay? Remember this? Now, why is it important? Very important. Why? I'll tell you why. Okay? In this condition, it's usually like this. A mother is RH negative. What is RH? It comes from the word rhesus monkey. Yeah. So like me, I am type B positive. What does positive mean? RH positive. Okay? 
But I'm type blood type B. Who among you are type B here? Who is blood type B as in boy? You better give me your phone number and so, okay? Because I'm also B. So if I need blood on the freeway, I go home today and I'm bleeding there, I have an accident, I will text you, I'll call you personally. What's your name? Shapaya. Huh? Shapaya. I don't even pronounce your name. Shapaya. <laughs> What's your last name? <laughs> okay, I was just hey, you are my former student, right? And I told you are my student now. I'm bleeding here on the freeway. Can you go to the hotel? They will touch with blood. Are you willing to donate blood? Oh, you get an A in this class, okay? <laughs> or A in heaven, okay? Okay, so I am B positive. I am IH positive, right? That means I am related to the monkey. So sometimes do not just mind me. <laughs> okay, mother is negative, negative, negative. And the father happens to be me. Positive. I am RH positive, father positive, mother negative. Is there a problem? There is a problem, right? Yes. They have sex, they, the mother gets pregnant, first baby got the genes of the father, RH positive, baby RH positive, father, the mother is negative, does she have any antibodies? No, no not antibodies yet. During the nine months of pregnancy, what happens after nine months? The baby is delivered, right? So the mother is in the lithotomy position, the baby is there. I already showed this in class, right? The vagina is here. Push, 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 vagina, vagina here. Push, 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 push. Oh shit, it's so that painful here, mom. Your, your muscles are so tight. And the woman she's out, thank God, I'm the first baby, I'm safe. <laughs> why did the baby safe? Why, why is the first baby safe? Very simple. The mixing of the blood will happen after placental separation. So the baby comes out first, followed by the placenta. How do you know the placenta is separate? This will come out in the nursing board exam, by the way. How do you know the placenta is separating? Two things. There will be, when the placenta separates from the wall of the uterus, of the endometrium, there's, of course, bleeding. Maybe the uterine arteries and veins, they, they separate. There is a sudden gush of warm blood at the same time lengthening of the umbilical cord because the umbilical cord now is separating from the, the placenta is attached to the umbilical cord. So those are the two things. Lengthening of the umbilical cord and a sudden gush of warm blood. During the process of placental separation, will there be mixing of blood? Mm -hmm. The mom and the baby, yes. But the baby is already out. He is safe. And when there's mixing of blood, the mother develops what? Antibodies. Develops antibodies against what? The Rh antigen. This is also known as D antigen or Rh. Rh antigen or D antigen. So you develop what? Antibodies against the antigen. Remember the word antibody, antigen, immune complex? So the problem now is that they get pregnant again with the second baby. Again, the second baby is R is positive. Will there be a problem? Yes. During the last weeks of pregnancy, it is possible, even though there is a placental barrier, the antibodies here can go through and attack what? The red blood cell of baby. The red blood cell of birth is called what? Hemolytic disease of what? Child. The newborn. What is hemolysis? Hemo means red blood cell. Lysis means breakdown. It burst. Will the baby die? Could be, right? Also known as erythroblastosis fetalis. Fetus. Red blood cell bursting. Will that kill the baby? Yes. Can I save this baby? Yes. You have to yes. pay me okay, consultation fees. Okay. okay, how do you protect this, my dear? Yes, you mentioned something like what? Rogam. You inject the mother with what? Rogam. Inject mother with what? Rh gum. Do you know what gum means? Gamo. <laughs> That's my name. I'm not kidding. I'm just kidding. Change this to what? Gamma. It, um, gamma globulin. What is gamma globulin? Antibodies. What's another name for antibodies? Immunoglobulin. In other words, what is rogam? Rogam is a synthetic. What is synthetic? Man-made form of antibodies or immunoglobulin that you inject to the mother when? 
in the first pregnancy and the second pregnancy. If I'm not mistaken, I'm not an obstetrician, you give it on the seventh month of pregnancy and during labor, two times. Why? Because by giving the antibodies here in the first pregnancy, you prevent the mother from what? Developing her own antibodies. It's like an example of what we call passive immunization. What is passive immunization? Injecting the patient with the antibodies. And you do the same thing for the second pregnancy. Can that help? Yes. So what is the moral lesson here? Very simple. How many of you know here of blood type? O. So that is only, what's your blood type? Who has O here? O. Who has A? Who has AB? And who has B? Only one. Okay, she's the only one who gets an A in this class, okay? <laughs> but make sure you donate your blood to me, okay? I'm just joking, of course. Now, so what's the moral lesson? How many of you here know that you are RH positive or RH negative? Oh, amazing, huh? You know, huh? Now, how many of, oh, you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to divulge HIPAA, you know, privacy law. How many of you are sure that you are RH negative? Oh, shit. <laughs> So you know, you know about this. Have you ever had kids? No. You had kids, okay. Did you know when, before you got pregnant you were RH negative? Were you injected with Rogan? Give me five. <laughs> so you know what happens now. Okay, now for those of you who do not know, you have a problem here. Let's say I'm a woman and my sex partner is there. We are inside the hotel room, <laughs> okay? And I am the partner and I'm about to remove my underwear <laughs> that I just remember, oh shit, honey, what's your blood type? I do not know my blood type. I do not know if I am RH negative or positive. Oh shit, let's abort, abort, abort. <laughs> Sex and wait. You don't believe me? Better believe me. I'm just joking, of course. The bottom line is, Whenever you donate blood, I think they will tell you where you what. I think they tell you this, right? They tell you your blood type and they tell you what. So were you able to do that because you gave blood here? See? Can you imagine? So if you are RH negative, Houston, we have a problem. Negative, negative. But she already knows because she was, she was given Roga. How many kids do you have? Two. Two. So you were, you were given Roga first, pregnant, second? And your husband, I presume, was, was he positive or he didn't know? No. So whether your husband is positive, it doesn't matter. It's always the negative mother who yeah. is the primary, not, not problem, but uh, <laughs> you have to prove <laughs> <laughs> My wife is positive. I am positive. We can have as many babies as we want. But the problem is she only wants three. I hated that. When we came here in 2002, I said, honey, can we have a made in America baby? <laughs> said, no. I have so much pain. I said, okay. Is it okay to have a baby with another woman? <laughs> I can even say the word woman. And I said, are you kidding me? Okay. I was just trying. You know. What if you say yes? And you can have with a blonde baby with the blue eyes. <laughs> See, I was just joking. Okay. I wanted a fourth kid, but I only have three. See? I want to have a basketball team, you see. <laughs> so I have a basketball court in the back of my house. Anyway, so do you understand the importance of these things we do for Rogam and everything, right? I'm not kidding. Some women do not realize every time they get pregnant, they have an abortion. It's simple, it's because of this, no? I remember I had a friend whose friend had repeated abortions. And they didn't realize it. Because somebody said to me, Dr. Gamo, isn't it routine that they do this test? Maybe, but sometimes they might overlook it and they don't do the test. And they don't realize that your RH negative. No, very simple problem. And this is manufactured by J. Gamo Industries. That's why it's called Gamo. <laughs> I have a dream to put up more on my manufacturing plan. Now, leukemia, uh, multiple myeloma, is a form of malignancy that involves the bone, right? And apparently, when you involve the bone, can it be very painful? Yeah. Yes, very, very painful, multiple myeloma. What about leukemia? Which among the leukemias listed in your study guide is involves the Philadelphia chromosome? Chronic myeloid leukemia. Which one involves children, commonly seen in children? ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Okay? 
Now, type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4, hypersensitive, there are examples given here. If I say strepto post streptococcal glomerulonephritis and SLE, what is that? Type 3. Type 3. What about uh, the use of um, PPD, purified protein derivative injections? Type 4. Remember, it has to be 10 millimeter and it has to be indurated, braced, and hard. And then what is the earliest time that you can come to have it examined? 48 hours or 48 hours? 48 hours, okay? So if you have done it at 6 in the morning of Monday, come back on 6 a.m. of Wednesday or after, okay? That's for what? The positive test for when you inject with a purified protein derivative, PPD, or tuberculin skin test, right? So this test isn't going to tell you whether you have PB, no. It will only tell you that you were exposed. Mm -hmm. So what's the next step? You do what? A chest x-ray. Blood. Now, which is better, chest x-ray or there's that new test that they say? Yeah, blood test. Blood test, there's a name. I don't know, I forgot the name. Uh, what's huh? What's the foron, yes. But also another way is for sputum culture, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, what about, okay, you see, you have transfusion reactions. If I'm B, B is B, B is good. Who, who, who among you are A? You don't give your blood to me, you will kill me. Why? Because when you give your blood to me, your red blood cell has A. Mm -hmm. What do I have? My, my blood cell is B. What is around me? Anti-A antibodies mm -hmm. in my plasma. Anti-A against, I hate the A's. You want A? Who's AB here? Okay. You have an A? You have an A on your AB. I hate both of you. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Of course, I mean, what I mean is don't ever donate your blood to me. Mm -hmm. You say, Dr. Gamma, I want to get an A in this class. I want to donate my blood. Keep your A's. I don't want your A's. Because if you give your blood to me, who will suffer? You or me? You. Me. Why? I am the recipient, recipient of your blood. When you give your blood, the moment your blood enters my body, what will my body say? Eh, eh, enemy, enemy, attack the enemy. Who will attack you? Your, your red blood cell enters my veins. My anti-A antibodies will... It starts to fight with So the blood, your blood vessels will group, agglutinate, and then eventually burst. It will occur here in my sexy body. It's what you call a blood transfusion reaction. Bad or bad? Very bad to me. And I can die of renal failure and mm -hmm. eventually I die, okay? You understand? Now, what about, uh, of course, asthma, aller aller allergic rhinitis, eczema, type one, right? One. What's involved here would be what? The mast cells releasing histamine, right? Mm -hmm. So we give antihistaminic drugs because histamine vasodilates redness and all these allergic reactions, right? And asthma is life. How many of you are asthmatic here? Who is asthmatic? No one, okay? In the other class, there was one, and I asked her, where is your inhaler? And she says, it's inside the car. <laughs> okay, and we were in the second floor. I said, if you have a asthmatic attack now, you have wheezing, <laughs> how long will it take you to walk from the second floor to your car? Five minutes. How long it will take you to become brain dead? Four minutes. I'm just joking. You will die before you can even use that inhaler. It's in the car. Who's going to use that? Nobody. Yeah. What is worse is where's your inhaler? Oh, it's in the house. Who will use that? My dog and my cat. Okay. <laughs> your dog will live, you will die. You understand? So asthma is life threatening. Be very aware of that, okay? So hematidia, gravis, muscle weakness, blah, 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 okay? Okay, what we'll do now is that we can have a short... Um, you know, I can't afford to have a break because we have to go to the sales lab. I have to give the quiz now, okay? Put those things in front, please. If you need to go to the restroom, you can do that in two minutes. Yes,